Welcome back everybody to another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Today I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Niels Kubis. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, Center for Humans and Machines. He is a behavioral scientist working on corruption, unethical behavior, social norms and more recently artificial intelligence. Also, he co-founded the Interdisciplinary Corruption Research Network. And together with Matthew Stevenson and Christopher Stark, he hosts Kickback, the global anti-corruption podcast. Previously, he completed a postdoc at CREED, the Department of Economics, University of Amsterdam, and a PhD in social psychology at the Free University of Amsterdam. Today I have him here and he will give a presentation on machine behavior and how it can be applied with respect to AI ethics. And I'm very glad that he's here. It's a very important topic and you will see this will be really an awesome presentation going into a lot of examples how machines can actually potentially behave and how they affect behavior of humans in response. So Niels, great to have you here. I'm very much looking forward to your talk and the stage is yours. the invitation and also the kind words um yeah i'm very glad to be here even though it's only uh, virtually i'm very happy to to share my uh recent research with you yeah i try my best to go through it in a slow pace because i am aware that this is a rather diverse audience and i hope i, I don't get too much into the weeds of uh, or the specifics of uh, one particular discipline because as uh, Andreas mentioned, I, I do believe quite strongly in interdisciplinary research and I, this research is very much uh, combining different approaches. And as mentioned, yeah, the title is Ethical Behavior by Humans and Machines. Um, the, day, the, the, the main part of the talk today is actually focusing on the question of how intelligent machines influence our moral decisions. Um, there has been a lot of research illustrating that intelligent algorithms, um, AI systems can produce unethical outcomes. Just, you know, one famous example are gender and racial biases in various AI systems, for example, facial recognition or jail and bail algorithms that are already used in the US. But what I think has been less discussed in research is sort of how these AI systems when they are employed can actually influence our ethical behavior. It's a sort of a second order effect. And the, the main part of the talk today will be based on a recent review paper that I published together with Jean-Francois Bonnefon, who is, is in Toulouse, and Iad Ravan, who is the director of the Center for Humans and Machines at the Max Planck Institute. In order to set the stage, and like I said, in order to reflect that I think this is a rather diverse audience, I want to take a step back and, and sort of explain what the field of behavioral ethics that I am doing most of my research in uh, conceptualizes as unethical behavior. And it starts with a very basic premise, I would say, namely that throughout our daily lives, we often face so-called ethical dilemma. And these are situations where breaking an ethical rule um, often leads to profits. And adhering to these rules is sort of the expected behavior of you. And you can actually also at times replace ethical rules with legal rules. So one example, for example, is like whether to cheat on your tax claims or to buy a ticket for public transport or maybe even uh, to tell an inconvenient truth is oftentimes a situation where you have to decide whether to break an ethical rule for private profit, oftentimes financial, or to adhere to these ethical rules. 
I think one of the, the strengths of the field of behavioral ethics is that it has developed several standardized paradigms that have helped to gain insights into these um, ethical, how people deal with these ethical dilemmas. And it has been quite popular across various disciplines. So behavioral economics, social psychology, management, but also philosophy actually has used such tasks. I'm going to show you one of them, which is also probably the most frequently used one. It's the so-called die rolling paradigm. Here um, in this task, people are invited to the lab and they are given a die and are asked to roll the die in private. For example, sometimes as you can see in this image here, there is actually even a, a hole cut into a cup. So that is really clear to the participant that only he or she can see the die roll that he or she rolled. Now, the twist of this paradigm is that Participants are asked to report the die roll outcome they observe. So in this case, for example, a one. However, they are getting paid according to the number that they report. So this produces a trade-off, a conflict between being honest or breaking the rule of honesty for private profit. This task has by now been used several, uh, actually, actually I think several hundred thousand times. Um, it, it has uh, recently gained a lot of uh, popularity, but and therefore has also allowed to um, conduct some meta-analysis on ethical behavior. So two big meta-analyses have been published in 2019, one in Econometrica, one of the leading journals in economics, which shows that people have a preference for truth-telling. So somewhat surprisingly to economists, it was observed that even though in this situation there is no formal punishment and people are completely anonymous, they don't lie to the full extent. Instead, they seem to have what they call a preference for truth telling. A second meta analysis published in Psychological Bulletin, one of the flagship journals in psychology, shows that breaking ethical rules is often done to an extent that people can justify it both to themselves but also to others. And we added a, a meta-analysis that zoomed in on how people are actually making these decisions. So we meta-analyzed studies that manipulated whether people had time to think about their decision or not. And we find that actually people cheat more when they don't have time to think about their decision carefully. So that when they have to make the decision whether to lie quickly, they often uh, tend to break ethical rules more. So these are some of the aggregate insights that we have gained into unethical behavior. However, as I noted here, most of this research has been done in social isolation. What do I mean by that? I mean that people have been making these decisions by themselves and there has not been any social component study. So in recent years, the field in behavioral ethics is shifting towards understanding the interpersonal elements of unethical behavior. For example, my dissertation actually was on the social psychology of corruption and has dealt with how these social forces influence our ethical compass. Um, and you can actually see that in many cases in real life, unethical behavior is not an, a mere individual act, but often is a very social act. For example, the Volkswagen scandal involved many people who are, were actually collaborating in the scandal. Uh, but also other forms of unethical behavior, for example, bribery, which is supposed to be depicted in this short illustration here, always involves a briber and a bribee. Um, so at least two people are in, involved. And from a social psychological perspective, that means that a host of factors play a role in such social behavior that are not important for individual forms of unethical behavior. For example, we know by now that actually when people collaborate with others, they tend to cheat more. Um, we are currently uh, doing a meta-analysis on that, showing that people actually, when they are uh, engaging in unethical behavior themselves, they tend to be more honest than when they are collaborating with others. Um, moreover, other people can serve as, for example, bad role models. So a host of research on social norms shows that for observing other people engaging in unethical behavior increases people's own willingness to engage in it too. And other research shows that even the perception or the belief that other people are engaging in unethical behavior is increasing people's own willingness to engage in unethical behavior. 
So we have conducted a systematic literature in 2019 showing that this is actually a very robust finding across disciplines, but also across locations. So the belief about other people's unethical behavior seems to have a very strong influence on people's own willingness to engage in unethical behavior. And so one of the main takeaways from this recent stream of research in behavioral ethics is that others can have, a, let's call it corrupting influence on people's ethical behavior. So they can actually have sort of pull people towards um, engaging in more unethical behavior. At the same time, I became interested in an approach that's called machine behavior. Machine behavior is a, a term coined by um, Yad Ravan and colleagues it basically, well, starts from the premise that by now, so-called AI agents can make autonomous decisions. AI agents is a term that has been proposed by several scholars to reflect that these decisions of AI systems are increasingly autonomous and unpredictable. So they can produce outcomes that are oftentimes not even explainable or predictable by those who develop the algorithm. And these decisions can have moral consequences. So some of the decisions that our AI systems make, I already mentioned them before, for example, these jail and bail uh, algorithms, or for example, hiring algorithms do have moral uh, repercussions. And in this uh, nature paper that Yadavan and colleagues wrote, they argued that we should study um, AI systems similar to how we study humans because they are increasingly taking over social roles in our human lives. And you, just below, I took a few examples from the paper. And studying algorithms in a similar fashion to how we have studied humans is what they call this machine behavior approach. So in a way, what we're doing in this paper here is to bring these two streams together, to bring a machine behavior approach together with a behavioral ethics approach and to understand um, whether we should be worried that AI agents in these different roles might actually corrupt people's ethical behavior. So what we did in our review is four things. Um, first, we reviewed the literature in, in various disciplines such as behavioral economics, social psychology, and human-computer interactions. We identified four main roles through which AI systems influence human ethical behavior. And then we highlight the psychological mechanisms that are at play. And for each of these roles, we finally estimate the current risk based on the available evidence, whether we should be worried about machines acting in those social roles and influencing our ethical behavior in a negative way. So let me walk you through these four roles. And um, in the color coding, you will always see what the current um, available evidence suggests is, you know, whether there is reason to be worried. So for example, for the role of a uh, role model, we color coded it in green to indicate that currently there is not yet enough evidence that we should be worried that people actually imitate uh, unethical behavior by machines. But let me first walk you through what we find. So, we, we start from the premise that by now online, people are exposed to both human behavior, but also increasingly machine behavior, right? So you might be uh, chatting with a chatbot, you might see comments from a tweet bot, or you might actually be in, in other ways um, exposed to behavior that is actually not coming from a human, but from algorithms. And there might be a worry that people would blindly copy unethical behavior by machines. So for example, online traders might imitate manipulative market strategies of trading algorithms. So there is a worry that maybe people, when they are exposed to unethical behavior by machines, might just copycat it. Um, this is based on psychological mechanisms that are actually quite famous and, and uh, well established in, in the field of observational learning, imitation, or conformity to social norms. And the current evidence, however, suggests that when it comes to non-moral behavior, conformity to machines is lower than conformity to humans. So it seems like people are less willing to conform to machine behavior than to human behavior. 
What we do find is that overall machine role models seem to influence children more strongly than uh, grown-ups. Um, and they might actually change children's perception of what is a moral transgression. So there are some signs that maybe the more vulnerable people like children might be more susceptible to an influence of bad machine role models. But overall, at least when it comes to adult you know, humans, we don't have a lot of evidence that people would blindly imitate unethical machine behavior. Which brings me to the second role. The second role that we identified is that of an advisor. As you probably are aware when you're using YouTube, Spotify, or any other uh, social media, people receive ever more recommendations from algorithms. And there are some uh, philosophers like Jubilini and Savulescu who argue that this could actually be used. Um, so AI systems could be used to be ideal, impartial moral guides for us. So people might actually consult their AI advisor to help them engage in more ethical behavior. However, unless the system is explicitly programmed to avoid unethical behavior, such systems could actually give unethical advice. Um, to give you an example, a firm called Gong.io is used to analyze sales calls by call center agents and to then recommend based on these sales calls what a call center agent should do. And if, for example, a deceptive strategy pays off such that people might actually lie a little bit to a customer to sell their product, an AI system could pick up that this is a, a, a profitable strategy and recommend it to its call center agents. So in order to avoid that, they would have to explicitly of, uh, program the system such that it doesn't give unethical advice. What's even more concerning to some extent is that the advice does not only um, appear in a very, let's say, machine-like way, but advances in natural language processing allow text to appear human-like. And I will come back to that point in, in just a moment. Um, so just to give you an example that has recently received a lot of attention is um, the chatbot called Replica. It's actually by the company labeled as the AI companion who cares. And it is a, a, an, an app that you can download and which you can program your own replica to appear the way you like it. And it starts learning your preferences. So it asks you about your hobbies, about what you like, etc., and then has a personalized conversation with you. Now, such AI companions have received um, actually quite an uptick uh, during the corona pandemic, because after social distancing restrictions were introduced, a lot of people downloaded Replica and used it. Um, and there have been reports in newspapers that uh, Replica actually instigated unethical behavior. So suggesting to people to engage in unethical behavior. And there are some reports that it at least did not stop people from engaging in uh, unethical and harmful behaviors. So these are more than 7 million users right now that are using Replica already. And so you could be worried that they might follow advice that is unethical that comes from Africa. But maybe even more concerning is uh, the, if we look a little bit in the future, um, there are already more than 100 million people who use Amazon Alexa and their chief scientist, Robert Prasad, argues and actually envisions that Alexa is increasingly turning from a mere assistant into an advisor. So. In a few years' time, people might not ask Alexa, hey, Alexa, please um, put on some relaxing music, but they might actually ask Alexa, should I break up with my partner uh, or should I cheat on my taxes? And so there might be a worry that actually people might, might imitate um, harmful behavior that comes from AI advisors. And in this role, we actually conducted um, our own little research on it, um, an empirical study that is currently uh, under review that I did together with Margarita Leib, Rainer Röke, Malus Hartens, and Bernd Illebusch. And it's entitled Corrupted by Algorithms, How AI-Generated and Human-Written Advice Shaped Dishonesty. And in this research, we actually examined the fear 
um, and tested empirically whether AI generated advice can influence people's ethical decision making. We also compare how strong is the influence of AI advice in comparison to human advice. And then in the sort of policy oriented question, we wanted to see whether um, transparency about the advice coming from an AI system would reduce its effect. So the recent EU report uh, suggestion for uh, regulation suggests that AI systems should disclose themselves as AI as soon as you start interacting with them with the idea behind it that it would help people to adjust their behavior and with the, the implicit assumption that they would be less influenced by AI systems when they know that it comes from an AI. And in our experiment, we actually tested that intervention. So let me walk you through how we did that. Um, we used, um, to, um, to measure unethical behavior, we used the dyadic die rolling game, which is similar to the die rolling game I explained to you in the beginning. The only difference being to reflect the social element of the uh, unethical behavior, it is played by two players. So in a first step, we have a first mover who observes the die roll outcome and then reports the number that he or she um, saw. <laughs> well, obviously, again, this person has a chance to misreport the number. Um, so first mover observes the die roll outcome, reports the die roll to the second player, second mover, who is informed about what player A um, reported, also observes the die roll outcome, and then reports his or her die roll outcome. Now, the twist of this game is that only when both players report the same number, they get paid, right? So basically, these uh, first and second movers need to coordinate on one number in order to be paid out the, double, the, the dice worth in uh, euros or pounds or wherever the study is run. And this was originally published in a paper in PNAS and since then has been used to study unethical behavior. And um, the, like I said in the beginning, it's sort of a, a, a social element of unethical behavior that can be studied with this task. Now, before first movers engaged in the task, we gave them advice. And basically, they got advice that either encouraged them to be honest or dishonest. And in order to do that, we recruited participants to take part in a study. We recruited almost 400 participants who were incentivized to write advice that either promoted honesty or dishonesty. So these were participants who were not actually doing the die rolling task, but were just incentivized to write either advice that would encourage people to be honest. For example, hey, I really think you should report the die roll honestly. It's really important that people are honest in society, etc. Or they wrote an advice that went in the opposite direction saying, hey, I really think you should maximize payoffs here. You should report the highest die roll outcome. Now, these texts were used to have a human advisor. And then we also use these texts to train an NLP, so a natural language processing algorithm, to produce AI advice. And the algorithm we used for that is called GPT-2. And I'm not sure how many of you know this algorithm, so I'm gonna quickly double click on that to illustrate how, how that works. So um, GPT-2 was released by OpenAI in 2019. And when it was first released, people were actually afraid that it would be too dangerous um, as it might actually produce, for example, fake news within a matter of a few clicks. And the uh, developers of this algorithm argued that it would produce human-like texts and therefore it would be dangerous if people could easily produce you know, a range of texts within a matter of a few clicks. Um, the, the difference between GPT-2 and other natural language processing algorithms was that it was trained on much larger data set and therefore basically learned basic rules of grammar, of semantics, etc., and could easily be trained on a specific type of text using transfer learning. 
What do I mean by that? I mean that it is quite easy with a little bit of training data to train GPT-2 to write a newspaper article or to write a poem or to write a tweet or to write an essay, right? So it is a very robust um, algorithm across different domains of writing. And that is actually the, the breakthrough of this algorithm because previously we have already had algorithms that could produce text also really well, you know, like of good quality, but usually it was, it was bound to one domain of writing. GPT-2 basically sort of opened a Pandora's box of being able to write across different domains. And therefore it received a lot of media attention. It was actually the first algorithm that was ever interviewed in uh, the Economist annual interview. And basically, uh, the economist asked GPT-2 about the future, and etc. So there was quite a lot of media, media frenzy. And so in order to test whether these statements about GPT-2 were true, true we conducted um, some research. So in, a, in another study that I did together with a former master's student of, student of mine, we used GPT-2 to um, generate poems. And as I mentioned before, we used actual existing poems by such prolific writers such as Maya Angelou, Herman Hesse, or Roman Frost, uh, Robert Frost to produce AI-generated um, poems. And we tested two main things. We tested, can people still tell apart whether a poem comes from a human or an AI? And sort of adopting standards from behavioral economics, we incentivized them to be accurate. So we didn't just ask them, which one do you think it is? We actually told them, look, if you get this correct, you can earn two euros. Moreover, we actually also looked at um, whether people are overconfident in their abilities to detect poetry. And what we find is that basically people cannot tell apart AI-generated poetry from um, poems from prolific writers. And it was even done, even, even so they were incentivized to do so. So in a way we can say that GPT-2 produces human written creative text that is hard to distinguish from human written text. Now, going back to the study on AI advice giving, we use the same approach by training GPT-2 on the human written text so that we would have two, two types of AI generated text. Namely, again, we had um, advice that promoted honesty and we had advice that promoted dishonesty. And in these cases, these advice texts were um, produced by this natural language processing algorithm, GPT-2. So as you already see, we had four types of text. We had human written honesty promoting advice, human written dishonesty promoting advice, AI uh, um, generated honesty promoting advice, and AI generated dishonesty promoting advice. So already four treatments. Um, we added another treatment arm in order to test whether the knowledge about who the advice was written um, influenced people's behavior. So we, um, what we call the information treatment, we manipulate whether the advisee, so the first mover, knows that the text was written by a human or an AI. So they were informed. For example, when, once they read the text, it said this advice was written by a human or this advice was written by an AI. Or in another treatment, they did not know the source of the advice. So here the advisor in the opacity treatment, they were actually only informed that there is a 50% chance that the advice comes from a human and a 50% chance that the advice comes from an AI. So we basically then had six treatments um, that allows us to test various things that I will show you in just a moment. But just to have a baseline, to know how much cheating and, and dishonesty there is without receiving advice, we included a baseline treatment where people did not receive any advice prior to making the decision on the diary task. So for this task, for the actual task, we recruited 1,572 participants uh, by a prolific, and these participants had a relatively high medium age of 40, 34, and were 61% female. All of the material and the pre-registration of the experiment are available on the open science framework. And you can also download the code that we use to train um, or to produce the AI generated advice. 
I hope the design is clear. So we basically, just to reiterate real quick, we had three different treatments. We had whether the source of the advice is a human or an AI, whether the content of the advice promotes honesty or dishonesty, and whether the advisees were informed who the advice was from or not, right? I'm going to walk you through what we found in this experiment, but I encourage you also to kind of like in your head, think about what you would expect. So what you see here on the y-axis are the die rolls that were reported on average, right? So in our no advice baseline, we find that people reported 4.22 on average, which means as you see with the dashed line here, they are over reporting the die roll outcomes. Um, so that means if you would expect people to be honest, they should on average report 3.5, right? Because it's a die. And so you can basically expect uh, that on average, that should be uh, the value should be 3.5. Now, in our baseline treatment, people are already over reporting. And that's actually a finding that is very common in the literature. So, as I mentioned before, people seem to always cheat a little bit. They cheat, seem to be willing to break ethical rules to an extent that they can justify it both to themselves and others. And this seems to be a prime example. So in this task, it seems that people are, are willing to cheat a little bit. The question then is, what happens when people receive advice that encourages them to be honest, right? So imagine you're doing this task and then you receive a text that says, hey, I really think you should be honest, but you don't know whether this advice text comes from a fellow human or from an AI system. Question is, would we find that the bar here goes down so that people are more honest? Well, in fact, we don't find that. We actually find that people are equally dishonest when they receive honesty promoting advice. And it doesn't matter whether this advice actually comes from a human, which you see here in blue, or from GPT-2, the AI uh, natural language processing algorithm that we used. So, with the first finding that we, that we see here is that when people receive advice that encourages them to be honest, they are not willing to actually follow it. The second question now is what happens when you're actually receiving dishonesty promoting advice? So advice that tells you, look, I think you should really um, report a higher die roll outcome here, et cetera. And again, in the opaque treatment, you don't know whether this comes from GPT-2, the algorithm, or you, a human. You can think about it maybe for a second for yourself, whether what you think would happen. So what we find is basically that in both cases, cheating levels go up. So you see here, actually, the average goes from 4.22 to 4.99 and in, in the human treatment, uh, 504. So cheating levels increase after people receive an advice that encourages them to be dishonest. And even though they don't know who the advice is from. Now, the next question is, these are all treatments where people don't know who wrote the advice. What would happen if we actually inform them about it? So first, let's look at honesty promoting advice. What would happen if people receive an advice that promotes honesty and they know that this comes from an algorithm or they know that it comes from a human? But what we find is basically exactly the same pattern as for the opaque treatment. So it doesn't seem to matter when it's honesty promoting advice, whether the advice, whether people know that the advice comes from an AI or a human. So that was actually quite surprising to us. We were expecting that people would be more likely to follow advice when they know it's from a human and less likely to follow advice when they know it is from an AI. Now, the final finding that I want to present is what happens when people receive dishonesty promoting advice and they are informed about the source. First, I'm going to show you that when the advice comes from a human, as we would expect, they follow it. And they know in this case that this is advice that comes from a human. So when, when they know like this, there was another human who suggests that you should be dishonest, we expected that people would follow it. Now, the second question here is, what would happen if people know that the advice comes from an AI? Remember, the policy of algorithmic transparency 
would basically suggest that this yellow bar should go down because people would adjust their behavior. They would know that the advice comes from an AI and they would think like, well, I'm not going to be, you know, for example, uh, sacrificing my honesty based on some inanimate uh, advisor. However, we don't find that. We actually find that the advice of uh, uh, GPT-2 is as corrupting as human advice in our experiment, which came to quite a surprise for us. Um, so we had several predictions that we pre-registered, but we did, not pre -register, uh, we did not predict that this finding would occur. So what can we take away from this study? First, honesty promoting advice does not affect ethical behavior, as you can see here and here. Human and AI generated dishonesty promoting advice, however, corrupts people, which you can see here and here. And even when the advisees know the algorithmic advice source, so in this case, they are equally influenced as if when they know that the advice comes from you. And so in a way, from a policy perspective, our first experiment here shows that algorithmic transparency might not always be enough to reduce corrupting influence. Right? So people, just by telling them that, for example, Alexa gave the advice, that might not be enough to reduce um, people's willingness to follow the advice. So to go back to the, to the uh, overall story, we have basically evidence from our own experiment that we should be somewhat worried about AI advisors having a corrupting influence on people's ethical behavior, because as we show in our experiment, they are as influential as fellow humans. And that's why we color coded this role in yellow. Now, let me walk you through the final two roles that we identified. The third role that we identified is a partner. So recently, there was a nature paper published that argues that we should actually increasingly study cooperation between AI and humans. And we should move away from so-called zero-sum interactions. So the zero-sum interactions are, for example, board games like chess or Go that have received a lot of attention in the AI field, but they are basically always structured in a way that my gain is your loss and your, your gain is my loss. However, when it comes to cooperation between humans, we often have what's called non-zero sumness. So we might mutually cooperate and both have a, a positive um, consequence of it. And so in this paper by Defoe et al. that was published this year, they argue that we should actually um, study such situations where people might cooperate with AI systems. And in fact, uh, uh, two years earlier than that, there was already a public paper published that showed actually quite a breakthrough, I would argue, that an algorithm called S-sharp could sustain cooperation with humans across multiple strategic situations. So these authors used standard economic games, so it's like, for example, the prisoner's dilemma, but also a trust game that people would play with each other, but also with algorithms. And this algorithm was actually the first one to be able to cooperate on a level that rivals humans. And the remarkable thing about this algorithm is that it wasn't pre-programmed to follow a specific strategy. So for example, there were already in the 80s uh, some tournaments where people had to submit their algorithm that would play in such games. For example, a very famous one is called Tit for Tat, argue, uh, or specifying that you should always do what the other person did in the previous round. However, the S++ and S-sharp algorithm that was used in this experiment actually dynamically reacted to participants. So it was learning based on their past behavior, how to react to it dynamically. And I, I think therefore it was quite a, a revelation that this algorithm was actually able to play across different games and a sustained um, cooperation with humans and with other algorithms. Now, you might be worried that such, you know, harnessing the potential of cooperation could also lead to negative outcomes, right? So for example, if you think about the GPT-2 algorithm I mentioned, students could basically cooperate with such an algorithm to create fake essays. And we know from research in psychology that such forms of collaboration often lead to, you know, a warm glow of feeling good about the fact that you're cooperating with others, you are sharing the benefits, but you're also sharing responsibility with another entity. And that tends to um, decrease people's own 
these feelings of guilt, right? So I mean, I feel less guilty if I know that I wasn't doing it by myself. Um, so far from the research that we reviewed in this, in this paper, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence that would suggest that human AI teams are actually, uh, you know, um, producing unethical outcomes. We know actually from very old research of these sort of very classical interactions between humans and static machines that people already delegate or, or I would say deflect some of the blame of the negative outcomes to the machines, right? So we know that moral, moral blame is sometimes deflected to machine partners and people actually experience less um, emotional um, reactions, for example, guilt when they are collaborating with machines. However, as sort of a countervailing force, um, people do not get any social utility from collaborating with machines. So what do I mean by that? I mean, basically, that if I cooperate with a machine versus a human, then this cooperation with a machine does not produce any utility for the machine, right? The machine is basically not get, gaining anything from uh, our cooperative situation. And so in a way, you could argue that to, from a psychological perspective, it might still be more attractive to collaborate with a fellow human because I can at least tell myself that I'm not just helping myself, but I'm also helping another person. So in a way, what we argue in the paper, which is a, a purely theoretical argument, because as I said, there isn't a lot of research on this uh, to date, unethical cooperation with machines appears plausible and there seem to be sort of um, conflicting forces at play. Some psychological mechanisms might actually increase people's willingness to cooperate with machines unethically, and others would actually um, suggest that it would reduce it. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a, it's a very, probably very fruitful avenue for research to, to test this. The final role that we identified is that of a delegate. So we know that actually um, one of the strongest trends in, in human AI interactions is that people can delegate tasks to AI agents, right? So you can actually let an algorithm execute tasks on your behalf. And that we argue could actually lead to some, yeah, you know, like harmful outcomes. And just to give you an example, there was a recent science paper arguing that we should be careful and protect consumers from collusive prices due to AI. What does that mean? It means that when people are setting prices on online markets, for example, on eBay, where you can choose that an algorithm is setting the prices for you, such algorithms might engage in what's called algorithmic collusion. So these algorithms might collude with one another and set prices that are actually harmful to, cons uh, to customers. And so in a way, you might actually use such an eBay um, algorithm without even thinking about the possibility that these algorithms might collude. So from a psychological perspective, this is quite you know, um, worrying. Because people can, A, they can displace the responsibility to this algorithm. They can distance themselves from the harm that they cause. And they enjoy some you know, general anonymity. Because oftentimes, it's very hard to know who actually delegated the task to an algorithm. And so from a psychological perspective, such AI delegates might actually cause harm. And people who use such algorithms might not know or actually actively turn a blind eye to such harm that is caused. And again, we don't have a lot of evidence for this yet, but just from a theoretical perspective, we argue that there is some new ethical risk that emerged from delegation to AI agents. And given that basically all the psychological mechanisms point towards people's you know, probable willingness to delegate ethical tasks to AI, we uh, color coded it in red to reflect that there might be some, you know, it might be some somewhat worrying that uh, people could actually, um, you know, cause harm without knowing. So to summarize the, the different roles that I have uh, discussed uh, up until now, we basically have the role of an advisor and the role of a role model. And here AI is sort of acting as an influencer, right? So these AI agents are nudging humans towards unethical behavior. But in the end, it is still the human who is doing the unethical behavior. So it's still the human in the driver's seat who is eventually um, engaging in the behavior. 
However, in the roles of a delegate and a partner, AI becomes more of an enabler, right? So people might actually engage in a behavior together uh, with an AI system or actually fully delegate it to the AI system. And what I would mean by enabling is that AI agents can actually allow people to pursue some selfish goals without really feeling guilty about it because they can basically deflect some of the blame to the AI partners and AI delegates. Which leads me to um, one of the, the last points about this section of the talk. Um, we, we know now that basically, you know, these roles exist and we are speculating and theorizing about the different roles that it might play for the society, but we definitely need more behavioral insights for better AI oversight. So we do need more research that actually tests how AI is influencing um, us in these roles and how it shapes unethical behavior. And for that, we argue that combining the two approaches I described in the beginning, a machine behavior approach and a behavioral ethics approach is particularly fruitful. Just one side note I wanted to mention, just because it sometimes comes up, um, the fact that AI is acting autonomously and can produce unpredictable behavior does not mean that we should assign the moral responsibility to the AI. Right, so what we are talking about here are roles that AI takes in the society, but there is always a principle behind the AI agent, right? So this can be a human who is using the AI system, or it can be a company or a government who is using the AI system on its behalf. And so we should always basically, when we think about like, for example, what should we do in terms of regulation or what should we do in terms of, for example, uh, legal responsibility, we should always look behind who is, uh, uh, we should always look behind the AI agent and look at who is the principal that is employing such AI systems. Now, I see that we still have a little bit of time and I basically, if, if okay for you, um, I would go into another project that I prepared for today, um, which is very recent research that was just accepted for publication. And it looks at something that is related to what I talked about before, and that basically assesses the threat that comes from uh, deep fakes. And um, this is a joint work with uh, Barbora Dolezalova, who is a former master student of mine, and my great colleague, Ivan Sorapera, who are both at the University of Amsterdam. The project is called Food Twice. People cannot detect deep fakes, but think they can. And for those of you who don't know what a deep fake is, I'm going to show you a short excerpt. And for that, I want to share my sound. I hope you can hear when this is playing. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I love it. Of course, with the audio experience, As much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till what's coming next. <laughs> I'm gonna show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. <laughs> What's All right. Um, you might have expected it given the title. This was actually not Tom Cruise. This was a deep fake produced about Tom Cruise. It uh, was very popular on TikTok. And the videos, I mean, there are several ones. You can check them out. And they basically, you know, show, sort of show in an entertaining way how deep fakes can be used, but also how powerful they have become. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as you might expect with the overall title of this talk, there are, I'm, I'm not only focusing on such entertaining ways of using deep fakes, but actually the potential harmful ones. And I just you know, uh, collected a few snippets from newspaper articles that discussed the different harmful uh, ways how a AI can be used to produce deep fakes that can have an impact on society. So for example, there has already been a case where a voice deepfake was used to scam a CEO um, out of several um, hundred thousand dollars. So the way it works is 
it sampled um, the voice of a, C, of a CFO, so that's the chief financial officer, and then was used to make a phone call to the CEO of a company and tricking that CEO into believing that it was actually the CFO calling, right? So imagine you're working in a company, you get a call from your boss and the voice sounds really like your boss and your boss asks you, please wire money to our account. We need it urgently. And <clears throat> this person did that. And there are several other cases that, that have been collected that seems to be uh, going in the same direction. If you're interested in that, I highly recommend a podcast called In Machines We Trust. It's by MIT Technology Review, and they have one episode only on how voice deepfakes are used for deceptive purposes. But also these uh, visual deepfakes. So oftentimes when people hear the word deepfake, they think of these videos that I just showed you have quite some damaging effects. And um, for example, they have been used to place people into porn videos and spread these porn videos. For example, there are some cases where journalists in countries where, you know, there might be uh, less promiscuous uh, rules about sexuality are placed in porn videos to actually re to, to damage their reputation. But actually, there's also a case where a mother has used deepfake to um, uh, harm their daughter's cheerleader uh, colleagues and send these deepfakes around. And there is um, quite a consensus within the AI community that deepfakes are quite a serious threat. So for example, there was a consortium of researchers, policymakers, and tech experts that met in 2019, and they voted deepfakes as the number one emerging AI threat. Um, now the reason is like, or the question is like, why should we be very worried about deepfakes? You know, we, we know that for centuries, if not uh, longer, obviously, there was fake information. Gossip has been around. Smear campaigns have basically existed throughout much of human history. Um, and even technology to alter facial images, right? Like the Photoshopping of pictures has been around for more than 20 years. So is deepfake really a different ballgame? Um, I would argue, yes, uh, there are a few reasons why. I think um, deepfakes, first off, they allow a new form of manipulation. So you can easily uh, manipulate the voice and the video. And so far, um, video content has been for a long time seen as the gold standard of veracity online. If you saw a video, you could be quite sure that it was true. At the same time, there is research suggesting that actually the majority of content that is currently watched on social media are actually these videos. So we should be maybe even more concerned about that. Um, moreover, I think that I, the, the other thing when looking into the future is that by now, the technology has, is advancing so quickly that it will soon become increasingly easy to produce uh, deepfakes. So for example, general adversarial networks are actually allowing to produce deepfakes um, at a much better quality for pretty much anyone owning uh, a smartphone. So they become more widely available. Um, just as an example, there is the Face app that has been downloaded several million times where you can, again, more for entertainment purposes, change your impression using such deepfake technology. But again, there is a dark side to it. So just last week, uh, um, an article published by the MIT Technology Review showed that actually within a matter of clicks, you can place people into such porn videos, which is obviously very problematic, if, especially if you consider that it can reach very large audiences on social media. So the one main question that we tested in this research is, well, can people still spot a deep fake video? Can they still tell it apart from a normal video if they are left to their own devices. There are some there's some research on detection of AI manipulated media, but most of this research has actually looked at either static images. So for example, this research by Grow et al, they used pictures that were manipulated and they show that actually people are quite good at detecting whether a, a picture was manipulated. Um, then there were some some um, other pic uh, some other studies again using static photos and also here the accuracy rates were actually uh, higher than chance and for video content um, there is not that much evidence that looks at people's ability to 
to detect the deepfake. The research that um, is probably most relevant here is by Vakari and Chadwick, but they don't look at people's ability to detect deepfake, but rather ask whether people actually believe the content of a deepfake. And they find that people are, that deepfakes can actually increase people's uncertainty about the content. So it might actually lead to, you know, um, increasing doubt when you're watching such deepfakes. So in our study, we actually wanted to test whether people could detect deepfakes, but we also wanted to directly look into sort of the positive side of things and test whether different interven interventions could help to increase accuracy. And so <clears throat> we know from a recent Nature paper that um, emphasizing that people should pay attention to the accuracy of misinformation and fake news actually improves their ability to A, um, you know, detect fake news and B, it reduces their willingness to share this information. So we basically use the same intervention by emphasizing that it is important to pay attention and we emphasize the harmful effects of defects so to motivate people to become aware of the negative consequences and to motivate them, therefore, to detect the face. This is, by the way, also a promised or promising intervention that was suggested in, for example, psychology today, going back to the Tom Cruise deep face, arguing we need such, you know, um, awareness raising and critical thinking to help people to detect deep face. So in our study, we tested, does it actually work? Um, does, you know, increasing critical thinking and um, pay, uh, encouraging people to pay attention, does that actually increase their detection accuracy? The second intervention we tested is a more, I would say, econ-inspired one. And then basically straightforward, similar to the other study, we paid people for accuracy. So we told them, like, look, if you get the, if you identify the defect correctly, you will earn money. We compared both of these interventions to a control treatment where we had no intervention, where people just watched the deep fake videos and um, were asked to tell apart fake from real. Furthermore, we also did some unpre-registered analysis uh, on the cognitive mechanisms behind deep fake detection. And so in the literature, there seem to be two types of biases suggested um, that you know, could occur when deep fakes are unleashed on the society, so to speak, right? So people could have a buyer bias towards guessing fake. What I mean by that is that they might start to think that even authentic videos are fake, right? Just because they don't believe them or just because they're not in line with their prior beliefs. People might quickly say, ah, oh, this is a fake, right? So they might actually overestimate how frequent um, deep fakes have become. And this is called the liar's dividend, right? So people might even become skeptical towards authentic content as soon as they learn about the, the, uh, the possibilities that are existing now due to the deepfakes. On the other hand, there might be a bias towards guessing authentic. So people, you know, in, in the end, the authentic videos are still the norm, also online. And people might generally apply a heuristic of seeing is believing, right? So as soon as they see something, they might think, oh, yeah, this must be true. Similar to maybe the Tom Cruise video that you saw in the beginning, unless you find real clear-cut evidence that there is some tempering going on, you might still believe that it's true. So this is basically the opposing bias that would suggest that people are overestimating how many videos are authentic. And in our experience, Experiment, we tested both of these um, cognitive mechanisms and compared them. Um, furthermore, similar to the other study, we looked at overconfidence. And overconfidence, I think, is a very important cognitive bias. Actually, uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, um, actually argues that it's one of the most widespread and costly biases in, in um, human nature. Um, you know, like they are diverse negative outcomes have been attributed to uh, overconfidence, for example, global stock market crashes, entrepreneurial failures, but even the Chernobyl disaster have all been attributed to people being overconfident in their own abilities. And we are arguing that, you know, especially for such visual input, people might actually um, have inflated beliefs about their abilities to detect defects. 
So we tested that and we predicted in our uh, pre-registration that people are overconfident in their detection abilities. Let me tell you what we did and how we did it. So we recruited 210 participants via Prolific, which is an online platform for experiments. We told participants that there is a chance of each video to be a deep fake of 50%. So we told them, you're going to watch several videos. There's a 50% chance for each video to be a deep fake. We use deep fake videos from an MIT uh, database called De Detect Deep Fake, which has 3,000 videos that are very difficult to classify for an AI system that tries to differentiate between deep fake and authentic. And we randomly picked 16 videos from it, and they were all about 10 seconds. Just so you get a sense, they don't have any political content. Promote health uh, and activity, kids that are more active into sports and other activities actually right so really short really some some mundane topics and i can tell you later maybe why we did that why we didn't choose you know like for example political or famous figures and so we had these videos and, oops uh, and here you see the overall design so basically we had 16 videos and people always saw eight deep fakes and eight authentic videos and we had two sets. So basically, we always had the fake video in one set and the real video in the other set so that we can compare on a video level people's detection abilities. And then, like I said, we basically had these three treatments. We had a control treatment where we didn't tell anything in advance. They just did that task. We had an awareness treatment where they read the short text about the impact of deepfake in order to increase their awareness and to increase their motivation to detect deep fakes and to pay attention to it. And in the financial incentive treatment, we paid them three pounds if they uh, correctly guessed the video in a randomly chosen round. I'm going to skip over that just in the interest of time. After these treatments, we asked people for their confidence. So after each video, we asked them for their subjective probability of guessing correctly. What do I mean by that? I basically mean that after every video, they saw a slider which said, how sure are you that this video is what you think it is? And then this uh, slider ranged from 50, which is basically the same as flipping a coin, right? Like you could say like, well, I'm not sure. I could have as well just flipped a coin. And ranging to 100, which is like, I'm 100% sure this is a deep fake or an authentic video. But then this is basically an unincentivized measure of confidence. And after they have watched the entire set of videos, we asked them, how many do you think you guessed correctly? And we paid them uh, half a pound if their guess was correct within plus minus one uh, round, right? So they watched 16 videos. We asked them, how many do you think you got correctly? Let's say I say, I think I got 12 correct. But in fact, I only got 11 correct. I would still be paid because it's within the, the bounds of plus minus one. Right. And then in the end, we asked some exit questions like, for example, how motivated were you to detect deepfakes, et cetera. Now, let me show you briefly the results. So can people still spot the deepfakes? So overall, we find a detection accuracy of 57%, which is higher than chance. However, when looking at these videos more closely, we actually find that there are only five videos for which the detection accuracy, which you see here on the y-axis, is higher than chance, which is displayed in this red line. For the vast majority of videos, people are actually as good as flipping a coin, right? So they're basically not able to detect the deep fakes for the vast majority of videos. And the same you actually find when you disaggregate across authentic and deep fake videos. Now, the key question, again, going back to our interventions is, well, does do, do these interventions actually increase detection accuracy? So in our control treatment, we see that people on average get 8.9 videos correctly. The question is, does intervention number one, namely increasing awareness, improve that? In fact, we don't find any difference. So the awareness treatment, even though the, the mean is slightly higher, the difference is not significant. And also for the intervention that just pays participants, which is called financial incentive, also doesn't significantly increase detection accuracy. We also see here, for example, comparing all three treatments leads to non-significant differences. Why? 
we argue that we have probably a ceiling effect. So we basically see that participants in all three treatments who are very motivated, and this would be expected in those two treatments, but however, even in our control treatment, where we did not give people any incentive to be accurate, people were still very, very motivated to detect defects. So we basically already have a very high level of motivation levels, and that's why these interventions probably did work. Now, let me briefly show you the cognitive mechanisms behind deepfake detection. So remember what we talked about, whether people are having a bias towards guessing authentic or a bias towards guessing fake. What we find in our study is a clear bias towards guessing authentic. So here you see, this is the 50% um, uh, range of people would basically be equally likely to guess fake and uh, authentic. And as you can see, the distribution clearly is uh, left skewed. So we have way more people guessing um, that videos are authentic. And the reason why I showed it up here is um, I'm going to show you that basically this interacted with people's um, correct guesses. And so people are guessing authentic in 67% of the time, even though they know that only 50% of the videos are authentic. And this is significantly higher than equal guessing. And what's really interesting is, like I said, that this seems to correspond to people's willingness to, um, or to, to, to their overall fraction of correct guesses. Finally, last thing, um, the unincentivized guesses of confidence shows that people are overconfident. You see the blue bars is always people's le level of confident which is higher for all videos than the actual accuracy. And for many of the videos, it's significantly higher. So we do find a uh, indication of overconfidence, both when done un uh, unincentivized, as I just showed you, and when done incentivized. So overconfidence is significantly, um, well, is, is sort of observed in both cases. Let me summarize. Um, Basically, two things I want to highlight on the study. First, people seem to be motivated but inaccurate. So they are overall better than chance, but they are actually, for most videos, um, just flipping a coin. Um, neither awareness um, increased accuracy level, nor did financial incentives. So this is in contrast to research on misinformation. And it seems like the discerning deepfakes is not a matter of motivation or attention, but ability. And secondly, finally, we do find a bias towards authenticity and overconfidence. So people seem to be guessing that videos, that deepfakes are authentic and seem to apply it to sort of seeing as believing heuristic. And the fact that they're overconfident in their own abilities might make them especially susceptible to being duped by deepfakes, right? So if you think that you can actually detect it, but in fact you can, this might be somewhat uh, more problematic than if people had an accurate belief about their own detection um, abilities. On that note, I would like to thank you very much. If you're interested in the work I presented, you can uh, scan the QR code or type in the, the name of the paper. You can also read about it in a recent op-ed we wrote for the Los Angeles Times, or if you have any feedback or question, you can write me an email, follow me on Twitter, or um, as uh, Andreas mentioned at the beginning, I also co-host a podcast. So if you're interested in topics uh, related to corruption, you can check out Kick back the global anti-corruption podcast. So thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I do have some applause for you. So we have a virtual audience and also virtual applause here. <laughs> this is great. This is really a great presentation. You bring up many, many, many important topics. And um, this is really a lot of thing that I probably also have to think about and to keep in mind when working on AI techniques. Um, you, in the beginning, you essentially, uh, probably for simplification, but unethical behavior, you associate that essentially to breaking rules. But uh, I mean, technically, there could also be rules that could be unethical. But I guess going into that direction is a general problem of ethics, right? And uh, we probably would just get too dis uh, too distracted in order to focus on the on the actual problems at hand, right? I think that's a very interesting point, and we've been thinking about it a bit. I think 
for philosophers, when we present our work, they often make very similar points. And what we revert back to in behavioral ethics is that we, um, by designing the experiments in the way that there are clear ethical rules, which participants, by the way, understand and also endorse, right? So we ask them also often in some of the other studies, like, um, do you think it is, is uh, ethically correct to lie uh, in this task? And they say no. Right? So in a way, we, we create a setting where there is uh, unambiguous rules and people seem to widely agree that these rules are, are useful. Uh, and in fact, you could say like, do not lie is probably one of the strongest ethical rules or widely shared ethical rules. I totally agree with your point. I mean, there might be several rules that are imposed where actually not adhering to them is the ethical thing, right? I'm thinking of civil disobedience, right? So for exactly. example, if you're, if, if you're living in a society that imposes uh, unethical legal norms on you, you should actually probably not adhere to it. These are very interesting questions and I would love to actually do some research on it um, to, to you know, get a better empirical understanding of it. But what I can say about the research I presented today is all basically, you know, circumventing these thorny challenges by setting um, a situation that is sort of unambiguous. And that's yeah, it's, it's interesting how the ethics can change when you expand the context. You know, you do not lie, but yeah. then you you lie because you have to save the life of your child because you need the money for a surgery or something like that. And then suddenly <laughs> all yeah. of this changes. But, but we can probably talk for hours about this. But <laughs> Can I quickly comment on that, Andreas, because it's really interesting. We, we have done some research, for example, looking at what happens if your lie helps someone else hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, lying goes up. What happens when your lie harms a concrete other person, lying goes down, right? So to some extent, these studies or these this paradigms allow us to, to look at some of these things. Um, and I think, yeah, like you say, ethics is a very contextual, uh, is, a, is a very contextual topic. And therefore, you know, I'm a big fan of them trying to mimic these contextual factors and do these experiments. Uh, absolutely. I think that's also why it's an exciting research topic, right? Because it has this degree of complexity. Yes, so, I agree. R really, really great how you uh, tackle these problems. So I have a question about the GPT-2 that you've been using. And GPT-2 has been criticized quite a bit as a kind of parrot that it reproduces the things that are seen in the training data. And when you showed the AI-generated text regarding the poems, did you also look at or try to measure, is it even measurable, how different the poems are that the AI generates and the real ones? Or is there a certain likelihood that they are just very, very close to each other? And that, that is the reason why they're very difficult yeah. to differentiate. Um, two answers to that. So for the poem study, we don't have a quantitative measure that would allow us to differentiate. We sort of eyeballed them ourselves and they are different. They are substantially different. I mean, the way we trained the algorithm was basically we had all this corpus of actual poems and then we gave it the two, like two lines of an actual existing poem um, and let it complete it, right? So it basically completed an alternative ending to a real existing poem. And from, you know, just eyeballing the results, it went in all different directions. So it, it uh, given that we had a relatively large training data set from Poem Hunter, where people are uploading poems, but also, you know, professional poems uh, are, are on there. Um, the, it did not just, do, for example, you know, stay very close to the original. So that in that way, I think we are somewhat safe that it's not completely, you know, like just giving a, mm -hmm. a very slight modification of the original. Um, again, also in this study, all the poems are openly available. So you can, you can have a look if, if you're interested. For the other study with the advice, we did use several objective measures to measure the text. Um, so, for example, we used Grammarly. Um, and to have a readability score, um, which is basically uh, assesses how well the text can be read by someone. Um, we had uh, the Grammarly score itself. So to sort of quanti quantitatively compare whether the text that was produced by GPT-2 is, is systematically different from human written text, then we don't find any indication of it. Great. And there's also here a question in the audience. Um, so also a question by me is, how was this honesty promoting advice? So 
did you say we will catch you cheating or you will get punished is that honesty promoting or did you just say oh please be honest um because it didn't seem to have a large effect on on the yeah. players yeah so that's a really good question because um in our setting there was no punishment and participants knew that right so we told them please promote honesty but be be true <laughs> like don't lie in order to produce honesty right so this would, would almost be like a nested ethical dilemma right if you use deception to promote honesty is it again ethical so what we encourage people to do was to not deceive participants some actually did um, some people for example said look i think you should really be honest because uh, you might regret it later on there might be some negative consequences so rather vague but from our experimental setup the participants who engaged in the task, they knew that there was no punishment. And so, um, therefore, I would say the appeals and the vast majority of texts of these appeals were actually, um, you know, promote, trying to promote honesty by making appeals to, uh, you know, sort of the ethical norm of honesty, not so much about punishment. So, so um, the, yeah. the, the punishment is a, is a typical honesty promoting uh, advice that we give in our exams and also for thesis writing yeah. work and so on. So. <laughs> No, it's true. And it's, it is probably also a very effective one. There's uh, research showing, for example, that if you play these games and there is even a small chance of being detected and punished, honesty goes up. Um, and there are some, you know, like you can obviously then play around with uh, what Gary Becker, a famous economist, called the simple model of rational crime. So he basically argues there are three factors that influence whether people are breaking ethical or legal, legal rules, like uh, What's the expected benefit, right? Like how much do I earn from it? What's the um, likelihood of getting punished? And how severe is the punishment? And people have been studying all of these three factors and basically finding partial support for, for his theory that oftentimes, obviously, when they're higher gains, people are more likely to, to cheat and so on. But the reason why, maybe one more comment on this. So the reason why we don't include punishment in many of these studies is because we are really interested in their moral preferences And not so much in their, let's say, economic calculation of do the expected uh, benefits outweigh the expected costs, but more about like when there is no punishment, do you still lie or not, right? So I think mm -hmm. that's that's a bit the, the motivation behind it. And what was the um, dishonesty promoting advice? It's, we, will, we won't check you just or you can make more money if you cheat yeah. or? Most of it was appealing to money. Um, so basically saying, look, by you know reporting higher numbers you can you can earn a higher payoff etc so it was really an appeal to be uh, profit maximizing i see and then you essentially refined the weights of gpt2 on the honesty promoting and dishonesty promoting yeah, separately, separately. Yeah, exactly yeah exactly okay cool it's 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 a really interesting study and it's interesting how the even knowing that the system was or the advice was generated automatically did not influence the actual effect of the advice that's that's quite surprising i completely agree so. yeah we were also surprised we didn't we didn't really uh, yeah like i said i mean we had these experiments and in behavioral science now you need to pre-register experiments in order to not you know later say oh we expected this all along I mean, yeah. so full disclosure we did not expect that this would occur <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also think your points about the moral responsibility is very important, that it should never be delegated to an AI, but you actually have to implement measures that the morals are still held. Do, do you happen to know a couple of examples what additional measures can be implemented to ensure moral decisions by an AI, like screening or? Yeah, I think there is now an increasing trend towards AI auditing, right, so that you audit the algorithm. Um, and like like I mentioned before, so that you also try to you know make a relative guess for how likely it is that it produces unethical outcomes. Um, another thing I, I looked at, which I find is quite inspiring, is research by Tito Hagendorf. Um, he looks at like whether by selectively training these systems, um, we could actually you know reduce the, the chances of. Um, unethical outcomes. So, for example, if we are looking at text declarations, 
if we could somehow sample uh, only honest tax declarations, then the chances of the system figuring out that you can cheat on it is, is much reduced. So he has this idea of selective training um, for ethical outcomes in a paper I'm happy to share. And the other thing I think is really important, actually, um, is sort of the, the question of do we, do we need a priori a sort of ethical uh, almost like an ethical review board for ethics uh, for for AI systems, right? So there, there seems to be, especially in in Silicon Valley and other places where AI systems are developed, um, this uh, general mentality of innovate first and ask for forgiveness later, right? So classical example are facial recognition software, right? Like it's clear view AI scraped, I think, several billions of pictures from the internet to produce a model that is very, very accurate and therefore has also fascinated a lot of people because it can detect faces quite accurately. But nobody ever asked, like, is that actually ethical? Is it okay to scrape people's faces from LinkedIn, from Facebook, etc.? Is it okay to then use it and sell it to police forces, uh, right? These are things that actually occurred. And so I think also Tilo Hagdorf in a I'm not mistaken in the same paper argues that both in terms of research and development, we should have almost like a, an ethical board that examines whether there are risks involved that might come from this system and therefore maybe, you know, impose some sort of regulations before it's even employed uh, and, and deployed on the society. Because I think otherwise you might always run the risk of having to regulate and catch up with things that are already um, on the market. So do, that's, do, yeah. do you think we have to label AI decisions as such that if you get a decision from an AI system that you know it has been generated by the AI system and then also need clear processes towards appealing such decisions? Yeah, I think this is a fascinating time right now because I think, you know, if you, for example, look at Google Duplex, which is this call assistant by, by Google, which can make, you know, you know appointments for you. And they interviewed some of the people that, um, you know, were received a phone call from Google Duplex. And then they were asked, like, hey, do you feel cheated <laughs> that this was an AI and it didn't disclose itself? Some people say, well, yeah, it doesn't really matter as long as the call assistant is, you know, adhering to send several, you know, general guidelines such as being polite, etc., um, but at the same time, there is, for example, what's called the, the Turing red flag law that says, like, we should really make it mandatory for AI systems to be disclosed as such. As soon as you interact with them, as soon as you're exposed to a decision of an AI, you should actually be aware that this was produced by an AI. And actually, even taking a step further, I think when it comes to deep fakes, I would probably say we, we definitely need something that discloses such things as AI generated. So. My answer, my, my, my short answer to your question would be probably it depends a little bit on the context, what I would expect the impact of it to be. I could see some cases where people are somewhat indifferent, whether they're dealing with an AI or a human, but then other cases, obviously, where it makes a really big difference. And I think my general, my, my general belief in transparency is still there, right? Like, even though we don't find an effect of it in our experiment, I still think that people should generally have the chances of making, you know, informed, um, educated decisions about how they interact with these systems. Um, so I would say generally transparency, yes. Whether it will always have the desired effects, I'm a bit more skeptical about. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the severity, as you said. Um, yeah. So a friend of mine created a Facebook profile during the pandemic because he wanted to discuss about research and stuff. And he used the exact same image as on his Twitter profile. And his account was blocked for perpetuity apparently by an automatic system and there is no chance of appealing so you have to yeah. go to court or at least get a lawyer in order to convince facebook to remove this block and he never did but i think that's that's not a good development yeah no i agree i agree i think there is uh, there are other cases for example in in algorithms used to estimate whether someone is credit worthy or not exactly and uh, people just get the information oh you're not credit worthy and without you know providing any explanation as to why and so i think this field of explainable ai which some of my colleagues at the mpi are, are working on you know how can you actually make these systems more explainable how can you use counterfactuals to make it more understandable why something was not provided could actually help you know
Yeah, but then the counterfactual could be something. Oh, you would have gotten the loan if you had, didn't have this health problem. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's very true. But then at least you know. Right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but I, I think that's a very important line of research. I completely agree. I find it interesting that today the deep fakes uh, sometimes the people use it uh, anon um, like in synonym with uh, photoshopping. <laughs> so deep fake can can be really AI generated, but also like uh, Photoshop. May maybe also Photoshop uses some AI, right? Um, but uh, I think the story that you've shown with the deep fake mom uh, it's a little bit debated, isn't it? Uh, because they also had forensic experts look at the deep fake video. And uh, they couldn't determine whether it is really a deep fake or not. Oh, and, okay. Um, That's good. Good to know. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I think you also had it on the slide. So the question is yeah. also just knowing about deep fakes, can that also lead to the problem of creating an easy way out of true evidence? Yeah. yeah? yeah. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the liars. Um, liars dividend. Yeah, I agree. Dividend. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. And I think that, you know, um, One thing, I mean, I mentioned it during the talk, uh, one, one design choice we made was we did not want to have political content in the videos because we were really interested in, in sort of the psychological cognitive processes involved in deepfake detection. And we wanted to answer a very basic question, like, can they actually, just from a perceptual perspective, still detect the deepfake? Um, now, obviously, in many cases when people use deepfakes, there are either, either political or ideological content that people want to promote, right? Like you might make a, a deepfake in order to, I don't know, discredit Joe Biden, etc. cetera. Um, I think here, it's actually much more likely that this liar's dividend is at play, right? So that as soon as there is basically, you know, reason to, well, it's sort of contrasting or conflicting with your prior, You guys, ah, it's a deep fake, even though it's right, real, right? So in a way that you might actually always just look for information that confirms your priors. And um, therefore, like you say, it gives an easy way out for actual veracity. So that, that I, I think could be a little bit due to the types of videos we use. And I think it would be really interesting to test whether when using more, you know, some, let's say more, more um, yeah, ideological content, we might find different effects. Also, I have a question about the overconfidence. So you said you had a slider from 50 to 100 percent for the confidence of the yeah. But that technically means that if you think you're wrong, you just select randomness. Yeah. Doesn't that impose a, a kind of bias towards overconfidence because you can't go lower than 50 percent? And yeah, that's I, I, true. I think this yeah. is this is something that is sometimes criticized also with Dunning Kruger effect and so on. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, let me let me show you. Uh, a very good point. Um, and I think actually, you know, like we, we initially had the idea of, of studying overconfidence and then realized, like, wait a second, it's actually not that easy to do, right? Because in another study, we arranged the um, the confidence from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. And then the question was, well, what does zero mean? Right. So if I know if I am confident in me being wrong, <laughs> how should we cope this? Right. So it is it actually it's not so trivial as I initially thought it would be. And so what we basically assume a priori is that people are trying to be correct. Right. So basically that given that they are trying to be correct, they can range in their correctness from being, you know, as confident as flipping a coin to being 100% sure that they got it right. But yeah. to, to, if, you, yeah. if you look in this plot, you see some people are worse than tossing a coin. Yeah, they Not get yeah, significantly, exactly. but yeah, no, no, I agree. And um, the, the interesting thing, I think, is, uh, again, like you said, in a way, what we are, we're setting up the study to kind of find overconfidence with this measure. And that's why we included the second measure of uh, overconfidence, right? So we basically ask people, How many of the, uh, let me see if this is the one. Yeah, this is the one. Um, how many of the videos do you think you got correctly? Right. And so um, there, it's, it's less sort of pulling people in one direction. Um, and here we also find that people are actually overestimating the number of videos they detected correctly. Uh, they think they got correctly. Um, And th so basically we can say that, you know, since both measures go in the same direction, we're quite certain or can be quite confident that people are overconfident. But sorry, uh, going back to your Dunning-Kruger effect, 
I totally agree. It's actually oftentimes partially mechanic because the Dunning-Kruger effect says that those with the lowest performance are the most overconfident. But in a way, that's often always the case, right? Like Because exactly. there's way more room to be overconfident when your performing works. Exactly. If you are really, really good, there is almost no room to be overconfident. And we basically try to depict that here with these lines, right? So if you already have very high number of correct guesses, then, you know, you see here pretty much actually there is no room for overconfidence, whereas those with lower number of correct guesses have more room to be overconfident. And I think we do find basically indication because it is correlated, the, the number of correct guesses and overconfidence. But then we also pay, argue in the paper that this is partially mechanics. So we should sort of, you know, be a bit careful about interpreting too much, but uh, taking everything together, we do find both for the incentivized and unincentivized uh, a relatively robust pattern of overconfidence. Yeah. And then there's, there's one more question here from our audience. Did you also check the professional background of your participants? So like people working in AI, could they have a bias towards seeing fakes everywhere? <laughs> Yeah, it's a very good question. I'm not sure if we do find a, a different bias among them. We did assess whether they have any experience with computer science, and that did not have an influence on the overall accuracy rate. Right? So it wasn't that people who have, for example, a background in computer science were better able to detect deep fakes. I'm not sure from the top of my head whether we do find a different bias for those people, but I can I can check that. It's a, it's a good point. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. This was an exciting presentation, also an exciting discussion. We went into many, many different points in all kinds of fields. Really cool research that you're doing. And thank I thank you very much for the talk, the discussion, and also yeah, the many insights that I gained during this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. As you've seen, we had a long discussion after this presentation, AI, ethics, behavior of machines and human responses to that, biases, all very important topics. You've seen that there were plenty of references in the talk and I think I learned a lot in this presentation. So I really enjoyed it and Niels, thank you very much for this great talk. Of course, the discussion doesn't have to end now. So we are both available on Twitter and you can contact us or also on other social media platforms. And I would be very happy to interact with you guys on these questions. So I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you in one of the next episodes of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>